So Sal Sigoyan will be speaking today. He's uh, the product manager for AppleScript and Automator over at Apple. I've been asked to remind you that if you have any uh, questions that involve Google confidential information, they should be waited, you should wait with them until after the videotaping is stopped because we might be doing stuff with the video later. All right, Sal, take it away. I'll also wait till I get my pen and paper out so I can write everything down. <laughs> like we could actually use it anyway, you know. It's like talking another language. You guys are over here going, lug, 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 and we'd be able to put the two together and be, why, why? We don't know what it is. So I just started off my talk doing impressions. That's great. Okay. I'm going to go from there. I'm Sal Segoyan. I'm the Apple Script and Automator product manager for Apple Computer for the last nine years. Uh, nine years for Apple Script, Automator is new. It just came out in our last OS release, which is called Tiger. And it's one of the many features, including uh, uh, Dashboard and Spotlight and a, a lot of the, the 150 new features that were in Tiger, one of which is Automator. And my bag, my area of expertise deals with automation. And automation is the lifeblood of any small business or anybody trying to get out from underneath a barrage of work and things to do. And it's an incredibly powerful tool because what it does is it lets you program without having to know any programming. It's basically drag and drop, answer a question or two, and in no time you're automating the kind of things you want to do with the computer. And Automator's scope covers just about everything that you can do with the OS, from getting very SQL to getting very photograph, or even movie-oriented, or podcast-oriented, or web page, or HTML, or you know whatever kind of data you're dealing with, Automator's really good at passing information between the various parts of a workflow. So I guess the best way to show Automator is just to show it. So what I'm going to do today with the giant cursor is uh, just give you an overview of what Automator is, some of the kind of things it does. I'm going to open up some projects. We're actually going to look at the code. I'll show you where you can go to get code samples and do your own Automator actions today, and uh, just answer some questions. So, anybody have any questions before we begin? Yes, in the front. <laughs> okay. So, I'm going to start with something simple. No matter where I talk and no matter who I talk to, what level of geekdom they're in, it's always good to just start with a basic example to get the concept across of what Automator is. So I'm going to start with something simple, and then we're going to get more complex. So on my desktop here, now you know why I have the giant cursor. It's really easy to see, isn't it? So I have a folder of some image files. Now these files are typical of the kind of files that you get off of your digital camera, right? They have these names that only the camera understands. I don't know what 20952207 is, but somehow that's related to the vacation I took down in Aruba. Now, what I want to do is I just like to rename some files. A simple, a simple task to do, right? Renaming files. Well, those Mac users of you, how do you rename a file in Mac OS X? You click on it, okay. So you select it. You don't click it twice. You select it once, and then you wait a second, and then you click it again. Then a name becomes selected. You select the part of the name that you want to change. You type that part, and then you either click someplace else or hit a return key. That's the way you rename a file. Well, that's fine if you're only renaming five or six files. But what happens if you have to rename 200 files, 300 files, 400 files, 500 files? What do you do? <laughs> you open up the terminal and you start going, gah, 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 gah. but if you don't know shell or whatever language you're trying to type into the terminal, you're pretty much up against the wall. And even then, there are easier ways than going into the terminal. And let me show you one. I'm just going to select these images by drawing a rectangle around them. Click on one with the control key down or right click, and you'll notice that there is a uh, menu now in the contextual menu, find a contextual menu called Create Workflow under Automator. I'm going to select that, and what will happen is this little guy will go boing, 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 and jump up and down. That's Auto, the Automator, and this is Automator. This is the interface for Automator. This is a workflow 
window. And let me describe a little bit about what the user interface is and how it works. And I'll show you how the workflow is created. On the left hand side, you'll notice that at the top there's a blinking cursor with a magnifying glass. That's the search field. So I can type in any phrase or any term like uh, renaming or uh, photo or catalog or something related to what I'm trying to automate. And actions related to that will appear on the list. This left hand list is a library of all the different automatable applications on your computer. And when you click one, for example, if I click the finder here, the actions related to that application appear in the actions list next to it. When you uh, select an action, information about that action appears down here in this description field. It tells you what the action does, what kind of data it accepts, and what kind of data it provides. And over here on the right hand side is the workflow area. With Automator, you create these workflows that contain actions, and each action relates to a step in your workflow or part of what you do. Now, since we uh, started Automator by selecting things in the Finder, the first action that was added to our workflow is something called Get Specified Finder Items. Those are the ones I had selected, and this action just contains a list of all of the files that I have selected. Its job is just to pass that information on to the next action in my workflow. That's all it does. So what I want to do is I want to rename, so I'm going to search for a renaming action by just placing my cursor there and typing the word rename. And the action that is in the finder group of actions that relates to renaming things is called rename finder items. It says this action changes the name of the finder items passed into it. Well, that sounds exactly like what I want to use. So I'm going to click on that item in the list and just drag it over here to the bottom of the workflow. You'll notice that the cursor changes to the green ball with the plus, meaning I'm about to add something to the workflow. And I let go. Well, one of the interesting things about Automator is that it has a lot of intelligence built into the background of how this application works. So it senses that you're about to perform an action on these files that is a permanent action. You're going to change their names. And it said, hey, I see that you're about to change the names of these files. Would you like me to copy them first and then you could work on the duplicates instead? And if I chose yes or add, it will add a copy action after the first action that copies the files, makes a duplicate of them, and then I can rename them. If I don't want to do that step, I can remove the action just by placing the cursor over here and clicking that little box. So here's my workflow. I'm going to take these items and then I'm going to perform a renaming process on them. Now, I can choose to do a variety of renaming operations. This action view, which is this little rectangle of interface here, each action has its own view, and this action view has a different set of options that you can do for renaming because, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can rename things. For example, you can add a date or time, you can add some text to the name, you can change the case of it, you can make it sequential, you can find and change text inside of that file name as well. But what I'm looking for is something sequential. I'd like each file to be named vacation, 001, vacation 002, that kind of a thing. So I'm going to check make sequential and you'll notice that the UI here changes so that it reveals all the operations for making sequential names. I'm going to have a base name and it's going to be called vacation and you'll notice that as I type this information into the action view that over here you can see the example of how it's going to look. And I can choose to place the number before the name or after the name. I can start the numbers at a certain digit. I can separate the number by a period, a dash, a space, an underscore, or nothing. I can just have it run right into it. I'm going to use a dash. And I want to make all the numbers three digits long. So it's vacation-001, vacation-002. And that's it. That's my whole process right there. So, 
what I'm going to do is try to move this so that we can uh, see here. I'm going to make a little copy of this. Go back. Okay, so I'm going to run this workflow, and you'll see when I run it that all the names of the files were automatically changed. Simple process, right? We created a workflow that took those files and then renamed them. Now, that's a lot to go through if you just want to rename some files. Can we take this workflow and make it generic so that I can use it at any time I want on any set of files? Well, yeah, you can. By default, every automator workflow can accept input from some kind of a source, whether it's the finder, whether it's an application. And it can take that material or information that's passed to it and work on it. So since I'm not always going to be renaming the same set of files here, what I'm going to do is just delete that action and keep this one. Now, I don't always want to rename my files vacation. I'm going to place the word untitled in there just to remind myself. And then I'm going to click this options triangle here to disclose this option, show show action when run. Now what this will let me do is when I save this workflow and run it, it will show me that little bit of UI for that action so that I can enter the name that I want to use for that particular set of files. So now I'm going to save the workflow, go up to the file menu and choose save as plugin. Now one of the interesting and powerful things about Automator is that you can save it so that your workflows appear at your point of need, where you actually need them. And one of the spots that we're looking at is the Finder. On my desktop, I want to save this as a plugin for the Finder. I could save it as a folder action so that when files were dropped into a folder, the workflow would run on those files. I could save it as an iCal alarm so that it runs at a certain time. I could save it as an image capture process so that when I plug in camera in, that workflow automatically runs on the images that get downloaded from the camera. I could save it as a print workflow so that from the print dialog of any application on Mac OS X, I can execute that workflow on the printed material. And I can save it also as a process if it runs from the global script menu that you see up on the top right of our menu bar. For this case, I'm going to choose the finder. I want to have it be a finder contextual menu. And I'm going to choose rename finder items as its name. Save it and now quit automator. So if I want to rename some files now, I just select them, hold down the control key or right click. And now you see that there's my workflow process right here on the contextual menu. I choose rename finder items. And you see up here on the menu bar, there's a spinning cursor here saying it's telling me which, work, which item is running in my workflow. And here is that UI that I just was working with, and I can change the name to Yosemite. And now go continue. So what I've done is very quickly and easily created a tool that I can use anytime I want now to rename files on my desktop. And I can take this workflow that I've created and share it with anybody else who's using Mac OS X Tiger because they have Automator too. And that means that they can take advantage of this. So I can create workflows that my staff can use to make their life easier, to make their work faster, more consistent, and more accurate. That's the advantages of having automation. A simple example, but it kind of gives you the idea, doesn't it? Mm, interesting, semi? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, let's look at another example involving websites. Because I hear you guys do a lot of stuff with HTML and websites and cool stuff. So, I'm going to launch Safari here. Now, we've all seen these kind of websites, right? Where, you know, Joe Schmo puts his family photos up. I do it too. We all do it, right? Everybody does. You post it, and there's thumbnails, and if you click one of the thumbnails, you get the pictures you know, of the larger size. You get the little picture of the larger size. There's Carrie D at Disneyland. That's her eating chocolate. So these are very nice photos, and I'd like to add these photos to my iPhoto collection on my computer. Well, how do you do that? 
Well, I click each one, I get the big one, and then I drag it to the desktop, and then I click the next one, and I grab the big one and drag it to the desktop, then I get them all together, and then I import them into iPhoto. Is there an easier way to do this? Of course. Like I said before, Automator handles a lot of different kinds of data. In this particular instance, we're going to use Automator to create a workflow that automates the process of retrieving large images from linked thumbnails on a web page, downloads them, imports them into my iPhoto collection after making a, a particular album for them as well. So since I'm going to be using Safari here, I'm going to click my Safari category. And one of the actions that is available at the top is called Gets Current Web Page from Safari. It says this action gets the URL of the web page dis displayed in the front Safari window. OK, that's pretty cool. I can dig that. And you'll notice that it's up near the top and that it has a gray bar next to it. That's a relevancy ranking. Automator examines what you're doing in your workflow and tries to guess what the next set of actions you would be using are and puts them near the top so that if you have a lot of actions there, you don't have to go searching for it. And it senses that, while well, you're starting a new workflow, so one of the actions that starts a workflow is something like that. So I'm going to get the URL of that page that I'm looking at. Now I want to get the image URLs from that web page. So I add that, and you see it has as a parameter of, do you want the images that are on that page or linked from that page? Well, I, want, I don't want the thumbnails. I want the big images. So I'm going to choose link from those pages. Then I'm going to download those images to my pictures folder. Then I'm going to click my iPhoto category over here and choose import photos into iPhoto. I'm going to make a new album called Carrie D. And I can delete the source images after importing them because iPhoto makes a copy automatically. So there's my workflow. Get the current web page from Safari, find those linked images, download them to my computer, and then put them into iPhoto for me. So I'll click Run. And you can see that right next on the left side of the action is a little spinning wheel telling you that it's the action that's being used right now. It also shows at the bottom of the window. And now it's creating the new thing and importing it into iPhoto automatically. So there's my new album of all the images from that web page. Golf clap? Semi-interesting? OK. Now, again, can I, like I did before, can I take this workflow and make it a tool that I can use anytime I hit a web page like that that has photos that I want to keep? Well, yeah, you can. Let's take a look at what it takes to make that particular workflow generic. So I'm going to go back to Automator. Well, OK, I'll use the current web page. That makes sense, yep. And I'm going to find the, the linked images. I can download them. The only thing that I really need is every time I make them import into iPhoto, I don't want the same album. I want to see that little bit of Automator UI when the uh, workflow runs. I'm going to change the name here to Untitled to remind myself that. And then go to the Options and choose Show Action When Run. And now we're going to go back to Save as Plugin. And this time I'm going to save it as a plugin to the script menu and call it Import Linked Images. Choose Save and Quit Automator. So the next time I'm on a web page, let's go over here and choose like Sam and Emma. Isn't this the most darling shot? Isn't that cute? They have, they have one here where they're at tea. That's cute. And they have their Sam. So these are some great shots. I want to add these into my collection, right? So I go up to my script menu and choose, hey, import linked images. So I run that. And it brings up the UI. I'm going to call this Sam and Emma. So now, using Automator, I've created a simple menu item, a simple tool that can be accessed from a menu. So whenever I go to a web page, 
the, as images I like, I just run this thing and it sucks them down and puts them into my iPhoto collection in an album that I name on the fly. Pretty cool, huh? Semi-interesting? Okay. Now, let's take a look at the family relative version of this. How many of you are the support center for your immediate and non-immediate family? Come on. Right. We all know it. We love our relatives. We love our parents. We love our, our in-laws. We love our brothers and sisters. But we all know that we are, we're like, no, 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 Cheryl. No, you don't click on that one. No, okay, okay, no, that's not the window. Right? Click on the desk. No, okay, well, wait, 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 stop. Don't click anything else, <laughs> right? So is there a way we could take like a workflow like this? If I have some photos that I want to share with some family members, I can't count on them having the wherewithal to go to the right page and run this workflow. I need to make something that's even more, I'm not going to say bulletproof. There's a better term. <laughs> you know what I was going to say, but I'm going to say bulletproof because I'm a politician. That's the truth. So uh, let's see. Uh, pardon me here. I'm going to run a little script, an Apple script here to clean up. Uh, a uh, thing, okay. So let's say that I have some photos here of my niece Trina's wedding, right? And I want to share these photos. So I want to make something that I can send in an email to all the relatives that they just click this thing and it automatically goes and gets the photos and it puts them on their computer for them automatically. So how do I do that? Well, it's kind of similar to what I did with Automator before. Let's take a look at it. So this time, I'm going to go to my Safari category, because I'm using Safari here. And I'm going to choose Get Specified URLs. This action passes the specified URLs to the next action. Hmm, OK. I'll add that. By default, it has a, uh, one URL in there already for Apple. So I can remove that by selecting and click minus. I don't know why that got put in there, but <laughs> somebody thought it was marketing. But so Now, if I want to add a URL to this, I can drag and drop them in from the finder. Uh, I can do whatever I want. But I'm going to just choose this button here, get current Safari page. And it adds that URL into this action. So the result of this action will just be that URL to that page. Now, we already know what the next action is going to be, and it's going to be get image URLs, get the ones that are linked. Then I'm going to choose the download. I'll have them go into their pictures folder, and then I'm going to have a new uh, import photos. I'll have it make an album called uh, Tom and Trina Wedding and then delete the source images. So there's the workflow that I'm going to give them. Go to this URL, get the image URLs off of that page, download those images, import those photos into iPhoto. Now, instead of saving as a plugin, this time I'm going to choose Save As and choose to save it as an application. Let's put it on the desktop, and I'll call it Get Tom and Trina's photos. And I'll quit. And hide that. So now on my desktop, I have this little guy standing on home plate. That's auto standing on home plate. So I send this little applet to the relative in an email saying, hey, double click this thing. And when they do, it starts running goes and gets the images, it's downloading the URLs, makes the thing, automatically puts it in. Voila, instant happiness. You are the good son. You are the good son-in-law. You are the perfect one. You have won. So there you go. So what we've seen is that Automator can deal with a variety of data. It can deal with files. It can deal with URLs. It can be saved in a variety of formats. It can be saved as a plug-in to the Finder. 
It can be saved as a script menu item. It can even be saved as a self-running droplet or applet or application like we just did here. So let's take a look at another way that uh, Automator can be used in a little bit more geekier fashion. Any questions about this so far? Yes, in the back. Ah, well, that's their problem. That, you have to get them on Macs. Yes. Would it work with Firefox? Yes. See, in that particular workflow, it didn't actually use the browser for anything. It just, you passed it a URL and... Right. The question is, is she's asking, well, can I do this with another browser besides Safari? Not if you're using the get current web page, but if you're getting get specified URL, then you can pass in any URL you want. And then you get the ability to have this automatic download process. The code that's used in these automator actions we'll be getting into just a moment, but basically that was using core uh, image I.O. routines inside the OS to do a curl command to the web page to scan it and then it used Perl to parse it and then it passed it on to a, another process for downloading. So the nice thing is that you don't have to think about any of that, do you? All you're doing is thinking about what are the steps I want to accomplish and then you're making this workflow. Yes, yeah, so over there. I'm, I'm sorry? Can I comment on the security implications of sending a self-running application to somebody in an email? Yes, it's a very dangerous thing. <laughs> you don't want your relative just doing that with anybody, but you, if it's you, if I'm sending my father-in-law an email and I called him up on the phone, I said, Harry, run this thing, he's going to be okay with it. What I tell usually uh, the people that I work with is, is, if you don't know who it came from, never run it. Yes. Is there a way to look in the application and see what it's going to do before you run it? If it's not saved as, as run only, you can actually drag the application back onto Automator and it will open up the workflow and show you what it's going to do. So you can go back that way. Uh, another question. There was one over here. Yes? When you built that application, you said, oh, you know what's going to come next. You really typed all those things in. Do you have no sort of to go pick some other? Actions. Yes. Okay, I'm missing a term here. Ghost up, meaning. I think if you had already created a workflow, right? You had that original workflow. Yes. Most yes. Could you have dragged that original workflow into the new workflow? Yes. So you can chain workflows together if that's what the question is, or you can insert things into workflows. Yes, you can do that. There's actually an action called run workflow. And it just appears as a name in the list. Or you can just take the entire action code and it will just insert those actions into the workflow. So we have workflows in, when we test that are like 100 actions long, you know, just to make sure that it can handle that kind of thing. So since we're getting a little bit geekier, let's take a look at a scenario of uh, I want to find all the images of a certain directory that have a certain property to them. I want to make an archive of them and add them into an email. And I'm going to use a different approach than I have used before with Automator. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use the finder to identify the uh, folder. So I'm going to select the pictures folder. And to watch as I drag this, uh, uh, what do you call that? That's a... Uh, an alias thing, it's a thing. Drag that into the workflow and you see it automatically picks it up as the pictures folder. And it creates that same get specified finder action items thing. It's gonna pass on a reference to the pictures folder to the next action. But for this action, instead of using a regular spotlight command or a finder command for finding, I'm going to run a shell script that I'm gonna write myself right now. You'll notice that if I click the automator category, there's a, a set of actions here like run Apple script, run web service, run shell script, and you can customize and make your own actions on the fly. If there isn't an action for what you want to do and you know how to write a little bit of shell code, you can write a series of shell actions together and just have them linked together and, and act just like a pipeline 
and pass it on. So <clears throat> you can choose a variety of different shells to talk to. You can do Bash, uh, CSH, TCSH, Perl, Python. So I'm just going to use Bash and I'm going to have uh, pass the input into as arguments and get rid of the thing there and I'm going to have it do a fine command t catching the variable that gets passed through and use name and the name will be small wed and then put a wild card in there because I know it's a JPEG so find all the JPEGs that begin with that in their name and then pass that on so I've just created an action myself to do a fine using the the shells find command. Now let's just look at the results of that. I'm going to choose this view results action and add that to the list as well. And all this will do is show the results of the last action. So when I run this workflow, you can see that what it did is it found all the pictures that match a certain parameter and passes those on to the next action as a uh, POSIX list of POSIX paths, right? So the next action I want is to create an archive. Well, I'll just do a quick search here for archive. And create archive. It'll create a zip archive on the desktop. And then the next thing I want to do is do a mail. Uh, mail, let's see, uh, new mail message. And I'll just have it add to uh, a mail message, a brand new mail message. So there it is. Uh, search the pictures folder using a shell command to do this, create an archive on a desktop, and then add it to a new email. There you go. So you can use other languages besides just, you know, AppleScript or, or whatever the, the uh, action happens to be written in. You can use Shell, Perl, Python, Java, Objective-C, C, C++, uh, C++ whatever you want, whatever language is supported by the operating system, you can use when you create your actions, or you can use these on-the-fly actions of run web service, run shell script, that kind of thing. Is that interesting? Ah, I see some wheels turning now. There's going to be, you're going to go back to the office and start writing these little workflows and shell stuff going, oh, my favorite shell stuff. Okay, so let's take a look at another example of the power of Automator and what it can do. Like I said, Automator can handle a variety of data. We've seen it handle text, we've seen it handle pictures. Uh, it can handle a large variety of data types and information. And what I'm going to do next is I'm actually going to do some automated database publishing with Automator a database and a layout program like InDesign or I'm just going to use our Pages program from Apple. Doesn't make any difference what program you use, the principle is the same here of what I'm doing. And let's make this fit in the window here so that you all can see what we're doing. And let's have it fit with. So here's a, a page layout of I want to create a, a product catalog. And there's going to be an image, and below it, it's going to be a description of the product, right? It's going to have its price, its SKU number, all that kind of name, all that kind of stuff. So I want to easily create a product catalog using the information that's contained in this FileMaker Pro database. Now, Automator has built-in support for SQL. So if you want to use an SQL thing, and Mac OS X has SQL Lite built into the core of the OS, so you can do that if you want to, too. I'm just doing a FileMaker thing because it's real easy to use here as an example. But I don't want you to think that this is by any means limited to just FileMaker Pro. So uh, I'm going to open up Automator. And I'm going to select my FileMaker Pro category here. And the first thing I'm going to do is choose it to go to a layout. And then I want to show all records. And then I'm going to sort them by... Uh, sort them by name and then after I've done that I'm going to go down to pages and I want to uh, have it get the information from using the SKU number as the identifier and have it retrieve the text that's in the summary field apply a style sheet to it let's see have it apply that style sheet to it and then do the same thing for pictures use the SKU number as my identifier, click product image, and then have it scale the images, scale to fill. Okay, so I'm applying some 
processes on the data up here. I'm, I'm going to a certain layout. I'm sorting the records. I'm showing all records, and I'm sorting them. And then I'm going to build the document. So I just click Run. And you can see that it will go through. And it's taking the text and formatting the text into the tagged containers. And then it's going to do the same for pictures. So in seconds, it just did this whole thing for me automatically. Now, what did I gain out of this? I get speed, I get accuracy, I get consistency. That could be an 80-page catalog, and I don't care. I'm going to go eat a donut while this is doing that. Right? Because it's an automated process of grabbing the data. Now, here's the $50,000 question. How did Automator know to put the pig image right there? OK, I'm testing Google, guys, now. Come on. I asked the same question at Apple, and I've, I've asked the same question at Microsoft, so I know who answers faster. How? Aha, it's all the hippie food, see? Too mellow. Here's the way that it's done. This, there's two ways that you do database publishing. I don't care what the system is. I don't care how much money it costs. These are the two principles of database publishing. They remain constant. There's two ways to do it. One is page geometry generation. The other is tagged container publishing. And that's the two ways you do automated database publishing. This particular instance is an example of tag container. Now, what is tag container? Well, each one of these little boxes can be considered a container, right? This contains a picture. This contains text. Somehow, this container has been tagged so that this container knows which bit of information in the database relates to it. And the way that you do that is I'm going to select this container right here. And in my script menu up here, there's something that's called name page item. And when I do, you'll see that that page item has already been assigned a name, 330452. Well, what does that relate to? That relates to a product over here that has a SKU number of 330452. So you use the SKU number as the unique identifier. For tag container publishing, you are required to have a unique identifier. It can be a social security number, an employee number, a SKU number, an address, something that's unique. You take that identifier, and when you t open up your layout, you quickly tag the various containers with the numbers. So you open up a template, tag which container goes where, save it, and close it. Then an automated process comes back and then fills it. So when that automated workflow was running, the uh, code inside the automator action would ask pages, give me a list of every container you have that has a name. Okay, then it goes to the first one, container 33540. Okay, go to the database. Do you have a, a record that has a SKU number 33163? Yes, it's right here. Great, container, here's your new stuff. Put it in there. Oh, by the way, I'm going to format your first paragraph with this style sheet and the next style sheet and the next style sheet and the next style sheet, and it does all the formatting. Then it gets the picture, it takes the picture, scales it to fit, takes the largest percentage, and then applies it to the other side and centers it, and that's the way that you do automated center publishing. The other possible way, one second, the other possible way of doing database publishing is, con is container generation or geometry generation, where the database will actually make the container as it needs it. And that's a little bit more complex because the database has to contain the code for geometry generation on the page. But those are the two principles. And the nice thing about tag container is once it's done, you can delete that information, go back to it, and put in the new information. This, have you ever seen a car trader? In 7-Eleven, those little things, car trader, ding, done like this. A real estate publication, new homes in America, and that's how these are done. TV guide, all of the tables in TV guide, and that's how this is done. And it's all done using this type of technology, and it's really done on Macs using AppleScript. It's the driving language. Okay, your question over here. I'm sorry? Could you use Automator to put in the SKU? Sure. I mean, you could figure out whatever formula you want. 
you know, based upon sales of a product, it gets the top left corner, and then it figures out the position for everybody else based on their sales, goes through and generates that too. That's why the print industry figured out a long time ago that they couldn't hire enough people to do all the work they needed. So in the 90s, print publication automated using these kind of techniques. And that's how they were able to expand and grow. You cannot scale unless you automate. There's no way to add more people, because all you're doing is adding more possible mistakes and more costs. If you want to scale, you automate. And if you want to automate, use Automator. Is this getting interesting at all? Hmm, he's making me think. Wait a minute. OK, one last example I was going to show deals with podcasts. Because I figured, you know, something about podcasting, what can I do? And here's a little scenario. So I just have some text. I have this action that I wrote. By the way, I'm going to share with you all of the actions that you just saw today. I'll tell you in just a minute. And I want to call it famous. Yes. This action does nothing but pass on a text of a famous speech or document. You know? That's what all it is, is if I ever want the Gettysburg Address, I run this action and it produces text. So if I want a new text document over here, I would just go like uh, text edit, uh, new text edit document, and then run this, and pff, I'd have the Gettysburg Address show up in a new text edit document, right? But I want to convert this to audio. So what I'm going to do is click on the system down here and choose text to audio file. I'm going to pick a voice. Isn't it nice to have a computer that will talk to you? All right, try it again. Isn't it nice to have a computer that will talk to you? That's not a bad voice. It's from Kepstrel. Kepstrel makes voices and phenomenal. They have this English news announcer voice that is like the BBC. It's killer. So I'm going to have this thing down here called Gettysburg. And that's going to produce an AIFF high quality file that then I want to pass on to uh, uh, QuickTime to compress into an MPEG audio format that will be something like in a mono range, about 48 uh, megahertz here, let's see, 48 something, about 48 mono, 44.1, yeah, that's good. I uh, use the same destination as the source file, delete the source file when it's done, and then uh, I'm going to have it open up in the QuickTime player, but if I want to make a podcast, I can just add this thing called Create Podcast Feed, fill out all the information, and it will take that audio file and generate the matching XML that goes with it, and then you post both those files on your server, and you have an instant podcast. But for our purposes here, I just want to open it up and play it. So I'm going to go back to the Finder, choose Open Finder Items, and open that up with the QuickTime Player. Uh, where is it? Q, 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 P, Q. Okay. Give me the text of the Gettysburg Address, render it as an audio file, then compress it in using MPEG AAC, and then open it up. And there we go. That's exporting it, doing the compression. And here it is. Four score and seven years ago our fathers brought forth on this continent, a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great... So, it's not the same as if Leo Laporte's sitting there talking into a, a snowball microphone, right? But if you just have some text content that you would like to be able to podcast, wow, that's a great workflow to have, isn't it? So like I said, Automator can handle a variety of data. It can handle textual data, picture data, audio data, video data, doesn't make any difference. And it handles the whole range of stuff on the operating system. Now let's take a look at what it takes to make an Automator action. Interested? OK. I'm going to uh, 
go to the developer folder, because yeah, I've installed the developer tools, and open up Xcode. Now, Xcode is the application that we use to create uh, projects on Mac OS X. And if you choose the file menu and you choose new project, you'll see right at the top that you can create an action. You can create an AppleScript based action, a Cocoa based action, or a Shell script based action. So you can create a shell action for yourself, brand new, that contains UI and buttons and everything linked to your shell code. Or you can use Coco and have it linked to your Coco code or your C code or your Java code or whatever else you want to put in there. And then you can add, do the same with an AppleScript action so that it links to code as well. And then you can include other code sources in with the AppleScript so it's just not AppleScript. It can also contain some Objective-C, for example. So once you open up a thing, it will ask you to name it, and this is what the project looks like. On the left hand side are all of your components. You get a, a main.apple script, you get uh, resources with a nib, and the nib is your UI. So let me open up an existing project here that I have, and I downloaded this from the site I'm going to turn you on to in just a second. And let's go action projects. And this one's called Download NOAA Weather Satellite. And this action does one thing. It goes and gets an image from a weather satellite up at the National Oceanic and Air Atmosphere Administration and then uh, downloads the image that you pick of a satellite photo. And I'll show you the action here as it runs. So I'm going to go get weather. Okay, here it is, download U.S. weather. Uh, East Coast, let's try West, Co West Continental, let's get the infrared, download it to the desktop, and then tell the finder to open it up in preview. Okay, and run. So there's the latest weather photo. Let's take a look at the code that makes that happen. So I'll go back over here. First of all, let's look at the UI. I'm going to double click this nib here and it opens up Interface Builder, which is the program on the Mac. Let's see. Open interface palette was not found. Try to load anyway. Sorry about that. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, that one's not going to work. Okay. I'm missing some palette that it used. Uh, let's try another one instead. Uh, let's look at my famous speeches and documents. So let's just take a look at that one real quick. And let's open up the nib. And here's the view. Here is the action view itself. And this is the menu. And if we go Command 4 over here, Command 1. And bring up the window. Let's show tools, show inspector. And the inspector palette's off screen because I opened Oh, here it is. So <clears throat> when you place an item, when you create a new project, you get this new type of view. And you, the view's resizable. You can size it to what you want. And if you want to add a button or something onto the view, you just literally drag it onto there like that if I wanted to add a button and then you can set the properties of that particular button like if I want it to be a small button right or I can size it to be a certain size I can change its title to reset or something like that and then under your parameters class over here you create a variable it might be reset is the name of my variable and then I can assign that through what is called the cocoa binding. So I go over here and I'd say uh, the target of that is going to be this particular variable when that button gets clicked. And now that's made the connection that connects back into the code in my project. But over here in this particular project, I have a very simple uh, uh, main script, and this particular script's written in Apple script. And all this does is when the uh, action is run, 
it finds the particular file that was chosen inside the action bundle and then opens it up, reads it, and passes on the code to the next action in the list. It also has another script over here that is used for controlling that particular pop-up. And you'll notice that in AppleScript, you can use this thing called call method where I can call in methods from other languages to have them do things. And what this does is it just gets a list of the uh, files that are within the action bundle, all the speeches, and then populates the menu for me automatically. Let's take a look at another project here. Uh, don't save. Let's take a look at something that has a little bit more complexity to it. And uh, let's see. Uh, create dated folder, save image attachments, get special folder. Here's an interesting one I just did. On the Mac, there's these things called special folders, which are like 40 or 50 different designated folders, and you can use them as jumping off points. And this is the UI for that. So I want the user to be able to enter a POSIX path in this text field. Well, I bind that, that the text field to a parameter that I create by clicking over here. And I bind it to one of these parameters here called folder, subfolder path. Select the text field. From your inspector, choose bindings. And you can see that I've already bound it here to this thing called value. Now, when the workflow is run, that value is passed into the handler over here in your main script, and then I parse that value out here called subfolder path of parameters, and then based upon what the user has put in there, I perform a particular operation and then pass it on. Basically, what this does is it uses a shell command, AppleScript using a make dir, uh shell command with administrative privileges to create a folder hierarchy. It's hard to show a lot of this, but let me show you where to go as soon as I answer this question on where you can go and learn how to do all this yourself. Yes? So it seems like you've uh, started out with something that's simple and generated in programming. Yeah. Are there, is, this, is there any evidence that this technique actually enables more people to control or program the Yes, I cannot share the. Oh yeah, it has nothing to do with programming. And I can't share the actual numbers, but I can tell you it's considerable the number of people that are using Automator now. No, they don't actually write anything, they just use it. And if, what they do is if you're looking for a particular action, you're gonna to go to a site like this, which is automator.us, and this website contains an overview of Automator, you take a tour, it will explain the interface about Automator step by step, explain what, the, what each step is, what, how the interface works, what it does. There's example tutorials over here, like the one I showed you about how to rename finder items. Right, but I mean, the people that are using Automator are a variety of people. We have people that are doing, you know, gene splicing with Automator. We have people that are doing image manipulation with Automator. We have consumers that are just doing things like downloading web page images. It depends on what you need from it. Automator can be as flexible as you like. And uh, if you click the downloads button here on automator.us, there's a lot of uh, actions there that you can download and install. There's developer resources if you're interested in writing actions. And I figured that since I was at Google, I could talk about this. This is not something I normally talk about. And there's also a resource button here that takes you to a list of resources about Automator. Example applications like Bare Bones BB Edit that ship with Automator actions. Action collections for Photoshop, for PowerPoint, for Office for Adobe Creative Suite, training and articles, books, podcasts, videos. There's a lot of different resources out there. There's also Automator World, and there's AutomatorActions.com, and there's about three or four other all-based Automator sites. So if you're interested in learning going beyond just basically using Automator and actually writing these things yourself, take a look at that. Yes? So suppose you want to do something like take your iPhone library Write an action to export things, say, by grading on the Uh huh. Is that already 
built in, or can you, if not, can you use Xcode to write that? Yes. It's not built in. That's not a particular action that's built in. Oh, maybe you can. Maybe you can filter by, let's see. Let's go over here and look in our iPhoto group and get selected items and then filter iPhoto items. Uh, we don't want albums, we want photos. Photos whose, no, there's nothing for rating. There needs to be one for rating. So rating is a scriptable do what you would do is you would write a, a simple one-line Apple script yourself that would go sort those images that are passed to it by rating and then pass all the ones that are five stars on to the next action. So that's a case where there is no shipping action that does that, but you could write that yourself by either doing one of two things. You could go to the automator category and choose run Apple script and then put in your own little bit of Apple scripting in there to talk to iPhoto. Or you could actually just open up Xcode and create a new project and create your own action that you can share with other people. So where do you go to find out what Apple Script that's popular? Apple Script's an entire week-long discussion itself, but uh, here's a quick tip. Every application carries with it an entire dictionary of all the things that it understands. If you take the iPhoto application and you drag it onto the script editor icon, it will open up its dictionary and it has every term and every class and every object that it understands is in this dictionary. And that'll give you a quick idea. So if I look under here, under rating, let's see, uh, no, I can't find anything under rating. Uh, I can't remember what they would call it. Let's see. Mm, album photo. Photo has a property of comment, date, time, height, image. Nope doesn't have a rating thing. So I guess you might not be able to. You might have to use Aperture for that. Aperture, which is our professional image collection manipulation program, and it ships with Automator Actions, and you can search by rating on that one. Any other questions? So just a quick overview. Go to automator.us if you're interested in, in expanding and writing your own set of actions, writing your own web service actions writing your own shell actions, writing your own Apple script actions, and using this technology. I thank you. Thank you so much for letting me come here today and be part of this. <laughs>